Thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Peg Peggy Zwabo is a, a local aging and mental health consultant. Dr. Zwabo pr uh, provides care for persons with de developmental disabilities, long-term care facilities, and elder care agencies. Today she's going to give a talk entitled Keeping the Person in the Care. Please welcome Peggy Zwabo. Okay, I'm technology uh, <laughs> impaired. Um, this is a very hard act to follow, and I think a lot of what I have to say, um, the Beck situation really makes it come home for us. But I wanted to start with a couple, just a few things about, want to go back to the literature and look when we're looking at who the carer are, carers in the family are or for this family. And as Richard said, he had some issues that he didn't even know about. And I think what happens is that this is a family affair. Some family are really strong about it and get assistance. Some, as Richard pointed out, go from Dr. A, B, and C, and each of them can provide a small mirror to what's happening here. But the humanity part the dealing with the pragmatic day-to-day -day or the loss of this person you knew back when. So I think we're going to look a little bit about that. When we look in the literature and look at person-centered care, which is kind of uh, an approach that we look at, because we're, most of us are dealing with both formal and informal caregivers, uh, family, friends, and the family have to educate and the person how they want to be cared for, uh, what their approaches are what's a good day, what's a bad day. So when we talk about the relationship, and that's when you saw those wonderful pictures of the staff who really love what they're doing, the people around them, you can just see it, you can feel it, it's there. I can't, I can't sell it, I can't give you a product, but people who like. I have to say, back in the day when we started a Jero Psych unit at St. Louis University, there was no one who had both psych training and aging training. So our question was, do you like old people? And if the answer, answer was yes, we go, okay, you get to pass to the next level. Because there wasn't that uh, orientation that we have now, so we were in the beginning. So what we're trying to do is strengthen the ties with the person. What does the individual want? What were they like? What would they like to do? What were their thinking process? We don't always do that. We get a diagnosis and then we tend to respond. Um, as a therapist and a clinician, I don't like diagnoses. I want to find it out on my own because sometimes they're not quite accurate or they're limiting. Um, so helping the care partners. What does the person like to do? And we'll get into that in a little bit more. Um, what we want to do is have that person get through the day. I kind of call it with style and grace. How can we plan these things, offer activities, um, encourage the person, turn on the music, um, and just kind of an aside about that, I use a lot of, I work with a lot of people with anxieties, um, and I use a lot of music. Pachelbel's Canon in D is a perfect resting heart rate. It's 72 beats per minute. So when you do that, there's hardly any genre that you can't use. I have a harder time with um, heavy metal finding a calming <laughs> but I try to work that with people that you need to, how do you center yourself, how do you calm yourself? You need a basket of interventions that we can try. Music may work today, but tomorrow it may be something of the cartoons. Uh, whatever works. Um, so we're putting more independence on the here and now and every day. Knowing... Um, accepting them where they are at that moment. A lot of the stuff that we end up dealing with is that we sometimes cause the reaction. We don't get the understanding. They're like barometers in many ways. They pick up the tension. They pick up what's going on in the facility, in the room. If I'm having a bad day, they know it. If you're in a relationship with someone, if, it's, if you've been around them long enough, you know, uh-oh. And when you have the uh-oh days, you have to think about it. Um, but, but the challenge is giving one as much independence 
experiencing a life worth living. Because as Richard very plainly put, uh, brought up, she did not say she wanted to die. She said, I am alive. I am here. Um, our interpretation may be that this wasn't the life she wanted. That may be true, but I am alive is what we go with. Um, I had a young man yesterday, and I mean a young man, 53 with the Lewy body diagnosis. And he asked me, I'm going to see him for therapy. And he's been in a ton of different kinds of therapies. He said, do your people talk about death? I said, yes. And particularly when they have certain kinds of situations. He goes, good, no one talks to me about that. I said, we will. Whatever you want to talk about, we will do. So experiencing a life worth living, but also find following the person's lead. Um, we all know it. If somebody's in a bad mood, we tend to back off if we're smart. If we're not so smart, we cause chaos. Um, any growth and accomplishment. We want to enjoy the moment. And I think people who live with these kinds of situations understand it's the moment that counts. The ability to talk about it later is our need, not necessarily theirs. So if they enjoy the cartoon or the movie you took them to or the ice cream cone, to talk about it in an hour is my need. I always ask, did they have fun? Did they enjoy? If they did, you did a good thing. In these kinds of conditions, the familiar is made strange. The house doesn't look like my house. This place doesn't look like my place. I know where I'm not. When people ask to go home, I'm not sure they're looking for a house. They know they're, I am not, not where I'm supposed to be. I don't fit here. For those, I always like working with nursing homes when we talk about people who try to leave. They're looking for home, they're searching. They know where they're not. And it's very hard to calm that down because I think it's a psychological what home is, a comfort zone, uh, a warm blanket, a, a memory, a feeling. And you need to go with the flow and talk about what they're looking for as we redirect them, hopefully, from leaving. So the familiar becomes strange. I also look at it and say the environment is now becoming hostile. I can't problem solve it like I used to. I don't interpret well. Is that psychotic or delusional? I don't care if it is. If the person's afraid of the coat rack, they're afraid of the coat rack. Whether it's an illusion is what I need for my fancy notes. Um, not particularly helpful. But it's helpful to identify these are the issues in making the person feel comfortable. And I think that's what we're trying to do is can they get through the day? Can we have some, some positive kinds of things? Can we both feel good about this? Can we all feel good about this? Um, and I think this is another one that I think is one of my pearls from working with individuals. It is so easy to see what the person cannot do. But if you think about it, when we do our treatment planning and our approaches, we're basing it on what the person can do. Can they feed themselves? They can pick up a utensil. That's a skill that we can maybe accent, reward. If they can pick up a pencil, I mean a, a spoon, can they pick up a pencil, a paintbrush to get to keep people using their whatever they can. All the losses are very apparent, troubling and un unanticipated. Every time it happens, the caregiver the family become more depressed or upset that this too is that slippery slope. We don't want to see the disease progress or the symptoms get worsen, worsen. So what we want to look at is what the person can still do. Now it may change a lot or hopefully they stabilize. Or I think the other thing that was extremely apparent uh, with Richard is back responded on her own time. 
we're usually looking too quickly for a response. Sit up. We want it to happen now. Have you ever had a kid? <laughs> Tell my husband to take out the trash. Does not happen right away. So we may have to adjust our anticipation um, and accept the person where they are. I think seeing the film or the videography that Richard has done gives us a better clue on how we can approach other people and that we have to take our time. We have to understand that we need the ladies who believe in Beck, encouraging her. Not all of us get a cheerleader every day. Um, and that is a, a marvelous kind of thing. But we do have people out there, and we'll keep bringing this back. Families sometimes feel so isolated, one, because they know how to handle certain things. They don't want anyone in coming in and disrupting their procedure. Sometimes that's not healthy. If I ask my husband to do it, I have to assume he's going to do it his way. And I have to accept that. If I want him to spend time with my dad, I can't orchestrate and control everything. As a caregiver, when we have figured this out, we tend to want this to happen this way. They want this, 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 and this. That would be nice, but what you want is the caregiver to get some relief, sustenance, ability to go take a 20-minute bath without feeling they can't. And that's, that's kind of a judgment call that is part of the treatment, is who's there for you? What can you do about it? Can informal or formal caregivers come in? And I think there are a lot of good people out there that if they know what they're going to be doing and how to respond and what's, you know, predicting worst case scenarios, that's what they're afraid of. If I give you a break while you take a half a day off to go do banking and shopping, what if A happens? What do I do? And people tend to isolate themselves and say, I'll just take care of it, it's just easier. Um, and we need to help them come to a terms to um, allow that to happen. Keeping connections, and that's the same thing that um, that we want to keep people who are interested, who are concerned, but they may need to be educated. I think if you listen to all the doctors involved in Beck's care, that probably Richard and Beck have educated more physicians in how to communicate with someone with a language impairment, with a cognitive problem, and they are smart enough, and if you work in this field, you go, okay, you know, that was right. I need to think about that or I'm too clinical. Um, the other thing I think is um, hard for clinicians is that we tend to do things that we have to do the evaluation in 20 minutes because of resources, funding, and things like that. Individuals with these conditions require much more time. We just have to figure out how to do it or get things involved. So keeping connections would be looking at routine. Who, who is willing to be available, who can be available, and how do we keep the persons together? Like Richard tried very hard for the longest time to keep Beck at home. When I first saw her, she was very distressed, and I kind of mentioned this, and that what she did respond to is we paced. My first evaluation with her, I think we walked our hallway around the building because she could not sit in a chair and do a traditional how are you, what are we going to talk about kind of thing. She could not do that. So you have to be resourceful um, in how you do your evaluations. The connections that we're looking at are the communication loop. What are the procedures? What are their likes? I want to get into that in a little bit more. Um, that family dynamics. In my family, my father has been recently diagnosed with dementia at 91. I think I'm from another planet because nobody understands, believes, so I know nothing about these conditions in my own family until they're ready. So 
it's hard, my brother told me. If you just talk to him, he's doing quite fine, and he is an adult, so if he doesn't want to do that, he shouldn't have to. And I go, yes, part of that is true, <laughs> but not all of that is true. So I'm having this, you know, I, I'm in a, um, not an expert in my own family, and I think sometimes that's really hard, is that the communication or the family. It means that both of my brothers don't want to see this. It's too painful. And I thought I did a very good job. I called him. I said, I had Dad evaluated this week by two experts, one at each university, and it looks like this is not something that's going to go away. So anything you want to do, get involved with, now's the time to do it. Don't come visit in a year. So we have a shorter time. I said, he's also 91. We have a shorter time. Um, and he's a stubborn old guy, but he might still be around. So that communication was not accepted. As a therapist, when I'm intellectually intact and emotionally, I know that a lot of times all I do are plant seeds. I planted the seed. Dad has something that is not going to go away. There are no real treatments for Please stay involved. I planted the seed. Whether it blooms, I don't know yet. Um, hopefully it will. So the fight family dynamics, the issues and stresses that they're going to. And uh, there's a, you know, the relationship with the person that's impaired. If you have a loving, beautiful relationship, as we heard about, you may have a different picture. If you have a conflictual, disharmonious, estranged family members, you got another load of woe that we have to address on some level. And the other one is the unity of care. Do we have a plan of action and what, what is our reasoning for it? Because not everybody knows. We do this because. Um, I heard the music, that music's on 24 hours a day for Beck. Um, I'm sorry I missed your name, but her friend at the nursing home says she does listen. So we have two reasons. If somebody came in and said, oh, I think music is disruptive and turned it off, they haven't heard the reasoning. They haven't integrated it. If that's true, that's another decision making. Now here's the real part of communication. As individuals, we come with lots of our own baggage personality. If you're a crab at 35, what are you going to be at 80? Mm -hmm. And there is a research study that says crabby people live longer. <laughs> so remember that when you're providing care. How I take that is what, what, what do you know about crabby people? What makes them different? They say what's on their mind. So my father's one of those. Uh, he's also ex-military. Uh, so if he goes, I ain't going to do that, I know exactly what he's thinking. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. He says, maybe he doesn't have ulcers, but he tends to say what he thinks. He shoots from the hook, hip. Some people don't like that. It's hard to hear. My mother, on the hand, communicates by smell. I'm just supposed to guess what I did wrong. Never will say it. So those are the dynamics when a person gets older or a person has an illness that we understand is happening. So crabby people live longer, so they're going to say, no, I don't want to do that. Or they may or may not sit up, not that Beck's crabby, but strong personalities or people who like to be independent want to make their own decisions when they want. Am I right? <laughs> okay, so and the other thing that I always look at, um, and I'll use my husband on this one, he has a PhD, he's ran special ed districts forever, he knows all kinds of information, he's very abstract, I'm the one who will beat him at trivia, he does not know anybody's name, I don't know if he knows mine, <laughs> never has... <coughs> Then that part of him. 
So before I test him on names, I need to know that he never did that. So if you're pre-problem behavior, and sometimes I think in some of our psychological assessments and testing, if you don't know what the person was like before, I don't do math, have no need for it, not true, but that's how I think. The only math I do are percentages off on a sale. <laughs> don't miss those. So I need to know that I don't do that, and I take that into consideration when I'm doing the evaluation. If I never did the checkbook, and we still have folks that have never done the checkbook out there, I'm probably not going to be really good in some of those serial sevens and upper math things, or lower math, depending on which end you're on. So you need to know that before we set the person up for negative observations, okay? So what is their behavior? What is their style? We, we look at those things. Um, keep it simple. Having worked in a nursing home, and that we're quite verbal, we speak too fast in too many words. Good morning, Mr. Jones. I'm Dr. Swabo. I'll be seeing you today. And how, what would you like for breakfast? He's back on good morning. Slowed language. Keep it simple. Most of our sentences have several commands in it or observations, and they're 26 to 27 words. A person who's not firing, just physiologically, is back on good morning. And you may walk down the hall and the person says, good morning, you don't hear it. The patient didn't respond. Keep it simple. Learning their language, Richard did an excellent job of picking out the themes of Beck's language. Love. Love. Life and loss came up consistently in a variety of ways. Not always the first word. There was a process or something happening. It was the way Beck speaks. And that's what we need to know. It doesn't matter what I think. It's how Beck speaks. So learn, learning their language. What are their preferences? If you never took a shower in the morning, and we say, the bathing person comes every morning, what do you think is going to happen? May not do it. Don't want to. Feels wrong. Okay? It's the same way when you see some of these things. You know, we're looking at dignity and respect. So when you see these things, um, I used to do some training for... Uh, when insurance discovered elderly needed programs and they were trying to sign up older adults. So I had all these people who wanted to know how do we get older adults to sign up for my health care options. So I, I gave them a simulated aging course. And I know several nursing homes do that. They make you old, they take something away so you can experience it. I made them eat beets, baby food beets. I did their nails. Polished them. Didn't check if they liked polish or if they hated purple kind of thing. I put gloves on them. I put Vaseline on their glasses and had them sign that against the law print. It's ADA, it's supposed to be 14 font, nothing's that small, that big. And had them look at it. How we do things that make people look more impaired or insensitive. So what are their preferences? I don't eat asparagus. Don't give it to me. You'll probably wear it. Okay? We need to know those kinds of things. Families know that for the most part. Some caregiver, carers do, depending on where they are in the scene. But we want to do that. Also the symbolism. Beck speaks in symbolism. Um, there was a therapist out there who wrote some Naomi file a long time ago, and she said what you do is it doesn't matter what they say, you interpret the feeling and the mood. That's coming from more of a psychotherapy orientation, that you go with the feeling. If the person's making so noises that seem calming, now listen to the noises, that, the different language that Beck had. Some of it was obviously sweet and romantic and happy. 
And when she was distressed, you didn't need any PhD to figure that out. You heard it. So how do you interpret their symbolism? Uh, one of my first persons I met was a from Russia, and he described his days in either being like Lenin or Stalin. So if you know your history, you could understand what he was trying to say. We need to know their language. Um, forced choices. When we asked people, and this is what I spend a lot of time with, if I ask you, the way I ask you can be adversarial. If I ask Jeff, do you want breakfast? Yes. Okay, Jeff's easy. <laughs> <laughs> then I have a positive. If he says, my goal is to feed, have him have breakfast, and he says no, now I've set up an escalation. I'm going to set up a confrontation. This is not going to be pretty. It's going to be a negative. Jeff, do you want an apple or an orange for breakfast? I change the communication to a forced choice. Do you want to wear this dress or this dress for someone who has trouble choosing? Doesn't always work, but it's a better way of getting what you want. So if you really want them to have a bath, you do not ask yes or no question. Do you want a bath? No. Well, you're going to get one. Is it what happens? And we don't want to do that. We want to back that down. So it really requires a lot of skill on the helping person, on, on the um, carers, be they family or what. The person who is the keeper of that knowledge is the individual if they can share it, or they will tell you by their behavior. Uh, my mother-in-law never weighed more than probably 89 pounds all of her life. Went to a nursing home and they're giving her mashed potatoes, meat, vegetables, and gravy. And I went, no, 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 no. <laughs> She's a lady who lunches. She'll eat cottage cheese, a little fruit plate, maybe jello, maybe a little muffin. You put that beaten potato, she didn't eat it. Foreign for her. Okay? So someone who knows the keeper of the information. Now, she came from a generation, back a little, a lot younger, where if you put it in front of her, she said, well, thank you. But she wouldn't tell you. I'm not going to eat that crap. <laughs> she just wouldn't do it. Okay? So you need to know that. So we want to forced options, but we also want to choose our battles in there. If eating is what you want, then we want to work out all kinds of food things. If you want them to take a shower, we want to work that out. And the Alzheimer's Association has some wonderful um, pamphlets and books to help people with difficult behaviors. They problem solving with looking at environmental, stress, physiological, all kinds of reasoning that the person might be uncooperative. With medication being down on the bottom rung. So we want to look at that. Medication isn't bad, but we want to consider the behavioral options. Medicine's easy in many ways. Changing behavior or working out a successful treatment <coughs> is much harder. You have to do it 24-7. You have to have consistencies. The other one when we're choosing battles that one needs to think about is, does it need to be done now? That's sometimes the artifact that we put on top of this. Yes, in some facilities we have kind of a game plan that we have to have these things accomplished, but if you don't bathe now or you don't eat now, is that a deal breaker? <coughs> Is it something that has to be done? Sometimes pulling back, going into a different direction, letting the person regroup. Because we come in, if I come in, I'm, I'm a hyper kind of person, lots of energy. I can make people upset because they're going, where is she coming from? <laughs> back it off. And that coming in softer. Um, with people who I know are agitated, I use a lot of behavioral problems. I heard music. I use another technique, and Richard mentioned it earlier, is touch. But you have to kind of know if the person enjoyed being touched. Some of us don't. You know, in the United States, we have about a 
three foot window where we've heard since we were little kids, anybody coming that close is up to no good. <coughs> you know, and so if anybody, and what do we do as healthcare people? We intrude in that three foot safety all the time. So I'm very, having learned sometimes the hard way. I always stay about four feet away, tell the person I'm here, because they may not be perceiving their environment. Hi, Beck, this is Dr. Swabo. Can I come talk to you? And I gradually step into her three feet. And what I found with her and a lot of women, because we like massages and hand lotion, there's a calming kind of behavior called effleurage that is a Swedish, and if somebody was here, I'd show you how to do it. But you basically massage the hand while you're talking with them. For those of you in certain disciplines, nursing, touch is one of their tools, one of nurses' tools. And back massage, calming hand, holding hands. Um, the nurse doing the nail clipping was holding her hand and occasionally clipped a nail. It was very subtle, very appropriate, but very calming, connected. When you're touching someone, you may have a better communication. I also make sure that they can see me, um, or I do some cueing. I work with individuals with uh, developmental disabilities, and sometimes I just have to cue them over with a slight touch, because they may go over that way, and they're not hearing, so I want to do that. Um, However, they may not hear you. That is true. Widespread hearing loss. Well, I think we have to look at all the senses. I'm glad you brought that up. You know, you want to use all of the senses if you're trying to get the person um, to remember, to engage. If I say, have something to drink, it's much easier if I say, have something to drink and hand it. They can see it, they can touch it, they can experience it. So when you have where these connections aren't working, we want to use all the senses. People laugh at my office because I have all these cueing to tell you what season it is. I have little cups that have pumpkins on it, Christmas, whatever may be. And when I ask people some of these orientation questions, that there are cues around the room that I also get a sense if the person is understanding their environment. Um, and I try to streamline my envir environment. This would be a very troubling place for some, some individuals to come. It's too busy, it's too many people, the carpeting is not, I almost fell up the carpeting, uh, because of my visual spatial changes, that you have to look at the environment. We may be making people upset in their environment. Um, so we want to look at that. Um, so first choices. The senses, and like you said, checking to make sure, and these are really hard things for some people to do, but we can look. Do they have their teeth? Or have they gotten to a point, my mother-in-law lost her teeth, I think four, four sets in one year. Um, that's a hard one uh, for families because it's not covered. That's an additional expense, but yet you want that to happen. Can she see? Where are her glasses if she wears them? Are they clean? As you said, hearing. Do they need their ears checked? Now, some of these are going to be very hard and you need specialists. And I think that's one of the things that people who work in aging or specific conditions, you can call the Alzheimer's Association. They have a list of dentists who do well with people with cognitive impairment so that it is less traumatic or less upsetting. Because that's another intrusive procedures, and some of us didn't like dentists anyway. Um, What's the understanding of the disease? Now, the, one of my concerns, I don't necessarily listen to staging a lot. That's for me. It's not always helpful for someone else. Oh, you're in the moderate stage. It's how is this disease affecting the person, the family? What do we need to do about that? How do we change the structure? Is it time to add more? Safeguards, because most of what we're doing is finding a safe environment in which the person can function at their highest 
or participate on some levels or we encourage that. So the staging, yes, it's, it's helpful to know what this kind of condition is. Or, but I guess the other issue that uh, Beck brought up going to the support group, it was the confrontation that this diagnosis was hopeless. Not everybody can hear that. And that's a judgment call when we have um, these kinds of things. I worked with, one, worked with one doctor and he said, well, this is just the way you're getting older. Didn't necessarily give a diagnosis even though the family kind of knew. And if the person asked or at some other point, kind of, this is the way you're going to be getting older. Your memory's not so sharp or this is not so sharp. Uh, there are ways to phrase it without saying the textbook prognosis. Um, issues of grief and loss. Most of my clients, or how I got into younger people, is adult children who brought mom and dad or a relative in were having their own issues and loss of a parent, changing roles, the whole idea of what this medication, what these kinds of conditions really mean or what they don't mean. They're very troubling because there are good days and bad days. Um, and when there's a good day, it springs hope within the family that maybe they're wrong. Maybe this isn't as bad. And so it's this constant roller coaster, or as the book says, the 36 hour day, that things are changing and it's beyond all of our control. Um, harmony versus disharmony. What I try to do is help streamline the environment so that the person can function in the way they want. I know that in some programs they go to the home and they help the family set up a safe environment, streamline it a bit. One of the more telling things, I used to do um, brain health with sixth graders and WashU's program was very nice. They gave us a brain that the kids could touch after they gloved up. And to talk about some brain health kinds of things, I asked the kids in the room to make this room safe for someone who was a little confused and got lost and, and nervous about getting lost. And they were absolutely excellent about you need to do this, you need to do that, so you may need to have someone come in and help you. Um, I know when I'm an adoptive parent, when I brought our son home from South America, my husband totally denuded the first floor. <laughs> it looked like a prison. I said, now he has to learn to work with some things. I said, we probably won't put out the very expensive uh, wedding crystal on the table, but you can leave out some things because you want the environment to be pleasant, but streamlined and safe, you know. So those kinds of things can be very helpful, but kids and other people or experts can come in and help do that. Um, Self-care and support. As I said, I started getting into women's issues because a lot of daughters, granddaughters were bringing, or daughters-in-law, not to say sons didn't, that kind of came a little later. But in, in our culture, primarily, women may bring mom or dad to the doctor. They have their own specific issues, and then we have issues that sons have. And a lot require their own psychological assistance, counseling, treatment for any kinds of conditions. Constant evaluation and reflection. Is this the disease or is this a situation? Is it what has changed? Sometimes the person hasn't changed, but maybe the staffing changed. A move, a hospitalization, um, someone who doesn't get it. So we have to look at that. So it's constant. How to handle negative or distressful behavior. There are a variety of things that are out there, but they have to be discussed about, and I think that's a problem solving. I don't want these big drugs, what are the consequences? I think Richard said about the um, Alzheimer drugs, there's still a plus minus, some docs are using them, some aren't. There's judgment calls. And I think the other part of it is end of life. What do you want to do about that? Have you made those plans? Has the person said what they would like? My mother-in-law, even though when she was confused towards the end, 
She had a list. And I have to say that some nursing homes are just exceptional. She had always been one of these people that told her she had two boys and a husband what to do. She ran the house. And she did that in the nursing home. She would call a meeting and make all the staff sit down, and she would tell them what they were going to be doing. It didn't make any sense, but they did it. Every Once a week, they had a Betty staffing. <laughs> and she went about, along her way and was very happy. If you told her she couldn't do it, she probably would have an untoward reaction. So we want to look at that as also a possibility. Um, I found this, and I thought it might be helpful. The website's at the end. This is the Dignity Challenge. It's out of a group out of um, um, the UK. And I think I just kind of summarized some of their things, but treat each person as an individual with personalized care. Beck has her own special way of seeing things, dealing with things, and she's really quite challenging in that her the metaphors that she speaks in. And if you're not sophisticated, you can underinterpret her. But she gives you enough clues. But I think with her and with anyone else, what is the behavioral response as they say these things and do things? What is the emotional response? That's what you're responding to. Um, a level of independence, that choice. What I wear, what I eat. Do I, what's a good visit? Some families need to be tra trained to do that. Um, there is a misconception that all visits to the nursing home or hospital have to be one hour or it doesn't count upstairs. That may not be therapeutic. 15 minutes may be an excellent visit. A visit when there is something to do. My husband went to visit his mother on Thursdays because that was free ice cream. He wanted the ice cream. She loved ice cream. They would go for a walk. She had been a gardener. If they could go outside, they'd look at trees, talk about plants, and had ice cream. We're task-oriented. We like to do something and do something with. Bringing in their favorite things, a flower, a discussion, a memory book, going through the photographs. Those kinds of things can be very, very helpful. Um, so the choice and care, the right to privacy, and I think that is really hard when more and more physical care is required. We say the nursing home or whatever is your home, and yet we don't always knock on the door and say, may I come in? We still t kind of treat it, we need to back off on that or just allowing privacy. Um, Act to alleviate loneliness and isolation. Does music help? Does massage help? Does cartoons help? Whatever works, we want to try to do, keep that, per what we're trying to do is keep the person in the here and now, to use what abilities they have, and to um, have them engage. Let them express. I think what we've seen today, able to say, I don't want to do that and understand that that's okay if we can do that. Um, so I think kind of um, we want to alleviate that person's loneliness. I think that's the part that we worry the most about, that the person is doing this alone and we don't always understand it and neither do they. Nor do our experts have any quick um, wisdoms for us to help them with this. Okay. Um, Here's the website, dignityandcare.org. They have a lot of good information and can be very helpful. Do you have any questions? <laughs>